Okay, it's working now. Um, hi guys. So I'm gonna read Life of Pi for about an hour today. I'm a bit tired, but uh, yeah, hopefully this will go good. We are starting uh, part two today, so uh, yeah, let's get started. Let's tweet out that I'm streaming. Okay, let's go. Part two. Pacific Ocean, Chapter 37 The ship sank. It made a sound like a monstrous metallic burp. These, uh, things bubbled at the surface and then vanished. Everything was screaming. The sea, the wind, my heart. From the lifeboat, I saw something in the water. I cried, Richard Parker, is that you? It's so hard to see out oh, that this rain would stop. Richard Parker, Richard Parker, yes, it is you. I could see his head. He was struggling to stay safe at the surface of the water. Jesus, Mary, Mohammed, and Vishnu, how good to see you, Richard Parker. Don't give up, please. Come to the lifeboat. Do you hear the? Do you hear this whistle? Tree, tree, tree. You heard it right. Swim, swim. You're a strong swimmer. It's not. It's not a hundred feet. He had seen me. He looked panic stricken. He started swimming my way. The water about him was shifting wildly. He looked small and helpless. Richard Parker, can you believe that what has happened to us? Tell me it's a bad dream. Tell me it's not real. Tell me I'm still in my bunk on the Simpson and I'm tossing and turning as soon I, and soon I'll wake up from this nightmare. Tell me I'm still happy. Mother, my tender guardian angel of wisdom. Where are you? And you, Father, my loving worrywart, and you, Ravi, dazzling hero of my childhood, Vishnu, preserve me. Allah, Allah, protect me. Christ, save me. I can hear a tree, tree, tree. I was not wounded in any part of my body, but I had never experienced such intense pain, such a ripping of the nerves, such an ache of the heart. He would not make it. He would drown. He was hardly moving forward. And his movements were weak. His nose and mouth kept dripping, wa kept dipping water. Only his eyes were steadily on me. What are you doing, Richard Parker? Don't you love life? Keep swimming, then. Tree, tree, tree. Kick your legs. Kick, kick, kick. He stirred in the water and and made to swim. And what of my extended family, birds, beasts, and reptiles? They too have drowned. Every single thing I value in life has been destroyed, and I am allowed no explanation. I am to suffer hell. Without any account from heaven, in that case, what is the purpose of reason, Richard Parker? If is it no more than to shine at practicalities, the getting of food, clothing, and shelter? Why can reason give greater answers? Why can we throw a question further than we pull in an answer? Why such a vast net if there is little fish to catch? If there's so little fish to catch. His head was barely above water. He was looking up, taking in the sky one last time. There was a life buoy in the in the boat with a rope tied to it. I took hold of it and waved it in the air. Do you see the life buoy, Richard Parker? Do you see it? Catch hold of it. Hump. I'll try again. Hump. He was too far, but the sight of the life buoy flying his way gave him hope. He revived and started beating the water with vigorous, desperate strokes. That's right. One, two, one, two, one, two. Breathe when you can. Watch for the waves. Tree, tree, tree. My heart was chilled to ice. I felt ill with grief. But there was no time for a frozen shock. It was shock in activity. Something in me did not want to give up on life, wasn't willing to let go, wanted to fight to the very end. Where that part of me got the heart, I don't know. Isn't it ironic Richard Parker, we're in hell yet. We're, we're, we're in hell yet. Still, we're afraid of immortality. Look how close you are. Tree, tree, tree. Hurrah, hurrah! You made it, Richard Parker. You made it. Catch. Hmph. I threw the life buoy mightily. It. I fell in the water in front of him. With his last energies, he stretched forward and took hold of it. Hold on tight. I'll pull you in. Don't let go. Pull with your eyes. When while I pull with my hands. In a few seconds, you'll be aboard and we'll be together. Wait a second. Together? We'll be together. Have I gone mad? Getting to the good stuff now. Yep. I woke up 
to what I was to what I was doing. I yanked I yanked on the rope. Let go of that life buoy, Richard Parker. Let go. I said, I don't want you here. Do you understand? Go somewhere else. Leave me alone. Get lost. Drown. Drown. He was kicking vigorously with his legs. I grabbed an oar. I thrust it at him, meaning to push him away. I missed and lost hold of the oar. I grabbed another oar. I dropped it in an oar lock and pulled it and pulled as hard as I could, meaning to move the lifeboat away. All I accomplished was to turn the lifeboat a little, bring one in closer to Richard Parker. I would let I would hit him on the head. I lifted it the oar in the air. He was too fast. He reached up and pulled himself aboard. Oh my god. Ravi was right. Truly I was to be the next goat. I had a wet, trembling, half drowned, head heaving and coughing three year old adult Bengal tiger in my lifeboat. Richard Parker rose unsteadily to his feet onto the tarpaulin, eyes blazing as they met mine, ears had tight ears lay tight on his head, all weapons drawn. His head was the size and color of the life buoy with teeth. I turned around, stepped over the zebra, and threw myself overboard. Chapter 38 I don't understand. For days the ship had pushed on bullishly, indifferent to its surroundings. The sun shone, rain fell, winds blew, currents flowed, the sea built up hills, the sea dug up valleys that Simpson did not care. It moved with the slow, massive confidence of a continent. I had bought a map of the world for the trip. I had set it up in our cabin against a cork billboard. Every morning I got our I got our position from the control bridge and marked it on the map with an orange tipped pen. We sailed from Madras across the Bay of Bengal down through the Strait of Malacca, around Singapore and up to Manila. I loved every minute of it. It was a thrill to be on a ship. Taking care of the animals kept us very busy. Every night we fell into bed, weary of our bones. We were in Manila for two days, a question of fresh feed, new cargo, and we were told the performing of routine maintenance work on the engines. I paid attention only to the first two. The fresh feed included a ton of bananas and the new cargo of female Congo chimpanzee, part of father's wheeling and dealing. A ton of bananas bristles with a good three, four pounds of black spiders. A chimpanzee is like a smaller, leaner gorilla, but meaner looking and less of the melancholy gentleness of its larger cousin. A chimpanzee shudders and grimaces when it touches a big black spider, like you and I would do. Before squashing it angrily with its knuckles, not something you and I would do, I thought bananas and a chimpanzee were more interesting than a loud, filthy, mechanical contraption in the dark bowels of a ship. Ravi spent his days there watching the men work. Something was wrong with the engines, he said. Did something go wrong with the fixing of them? I don't know. I don't think anyone will ever know. The answer is a mystery lying at the bottom of thousands of feet of water. We left Manila and entered the Pacific. On the fourth day out, midway to midway, we sank. The ship vanished into a pinprick hole on my map. A mountain collapsed before my eyes and disappeared beneath my feet. All around me was the vomit of a dyspe dyspeptic ship. I felt sick to my stomach. I felt shock. I felt a great emptiness with me, which then filled with silence. My chest hurt with pain and fear for days afterward. I think there was an explosion, but I can't be sure. It happened while I was sleeping. It woke me up. The ship was no luxury liner. It was a grimy, hard-working cargo ship. Oops. Not designed for paying passengers or for their comfort. There were all kinds of noises all the time. It was precisely because the level of noise was so uniform that we slept like babies. It was a form of silence that nothing disturbed. Not Ravi snoring nor my talking in my sleep. So the explosion, if there was one, was not a new noise. It was an irregular noise. I woke up with a start as if Ravi had burst a balloon in my ears. I looked at my watch. It was just after 4.30 in the morning. I leaned over and looked down at the bunk below. Ravi was sleeping. I dressed and climbed down. Normally, I'm a sound sleeper. Normally, I would have gone back to sleep. I don't know why I got up that night. It was more the sort of thing Ravi would do. He liked the word beckon. 
He would have said, Adventure beckons, and would have gone off to prowl around the ship. The level of noise was back to normal again, but with a different quality, perhaps muffled, maybe. I shook Robbie and said, Robbie, there's a funny noise. Let's go exploring. He looked at me sleepily. He shook his head and turned over, pulling the sheet, sheet up to his neck. Oh, Robbie, I opened the cabin door. I remember walking down the corridor. Day or night, it looked the same, but if but I felt the night in me. I stopped at father and mother's door and, and considered knocking on it. I remember looking at my watch and deciding against it. Father liked sleep. I decided I would climb to the main deck and catch the dawn. Maybe I would see a shooting star. I was thinking about that, about shooting stars as I climbed the stairs. We were two levels below the main deck. I'd already forgotten about the funny noise. It was only when I had pushed over, opened the heavy door leading to the main deck that I realized what the weather was like. Did it qualify as a storm? It's true there was rain, but it wasn't so very hard. It certainly wasn't a driving rain, you see, during the monsoons. And there was wind. I suppose some of the guests would have upset umbrellas, but I walked do- through it without much difficulty. As for the sea, it looked rough, but to a land bl- landlubber, the sea is always impressive and forbidding. Beautiful and dangerous. Waves were reaching up, and their white foam caught, up, caught by the wind was being whipped against the side of the ship, but I'd seen that but I seen that on other days, and the ship hadn't sunk. A cargo ship is a huge and stable structure, a feat of engineering. It's designed to stay afloat under the most adverse conditions. Weather like this surely w- wouldn't sink a ship. A oh, weather like this sh- surely wouldn't sink a ship. Why, I had to close the door, and the storm was gone. I advanced onto the deck. I gripped the railing and faced the elements. This was adventure. Canada, here I come, I shouted as I was soaked and chilled. I I felt very brave. It was dark still, but there was enough light to see by. Light on pandemonium it was. Nature can put on a thrilling show. The stage was vast, the lightning is dramatic, the extras are innumerable. And the budget for special effects is absolutely unlimited. What I had before me was a spectacle of wind and water, an earthquake of the senses th- that even Hollywood w- couldn't orchestrate. But the earthquake stopped at the ground beneath my feet. The ground beneath my feet was solid. I was a spectator safely ensconced in his seat. It was when I looked up at a lifeboat on the bridge castle that I started to worry. The lifeboat was hanging straight down. I was leaning in from the davits. I turned and looked at my hands. My knuckles were white. The thing was, I wasn't holding on so tightly because of the weather, but because otherwise I would fall in towards the ship. The ship was listening, listening to port to the other side. It wasn't a severe list, but enough to surprise me. When I looked overboard, the drop wasn't sheer anymore. I could see the ship's great black side. A shiver of cold went through me. I decided it was a storm after all. Time to return to safety. I let go. Hot-footed it, it to the wall, moved over and pulled open the door. Inside the ship, there were, there were noises, deep structural groans. I stumbled and fell. No harm done. I got up. With the help of the handrails, I went down the stairwell four steps at a time. I had gone down just one level when I saw water. Lots of water. It was blocking the way. It was surging from from below like a riotous crowd raging, frothing and boiling. Stairs vanished into watery darkness. I couldn't believe my eyes. What was this water doing here? Where had it come from? I stood nailed to the spot, frightened and, and incredulous and ignorant of what I should ne- do next. Down there was where my family was. I ran up the stairs. I got the main deck. I got to the main deck. The water wasn't entertaining anymore. It, it, I was afraid. That was just plain and obvious. The ship was li- was was listing badly, and it wasn't level the other way either. There was a noticeable incline going from bow to stern. I looked overboard. The water did look to be 80 feet away. The ship was sinking. My mind could hardly conceive it. 
It was as unbelievable as the moon catching fire. Where were the officers and the crew? Where were, what, what, what were they doing? Towards the bow, I saw some men running in the gloom. I thought I saw some animals too, but I dismissed the sight. An illusion encrafted by the rain and shadow. We had hatch covers over their bay pulled open from the from the weather was good. Oh, but pulled open when the weather was good. But at all times, the animals were kept confined to their cages. The, these were dangerous wild animals. We were transporting not farm livestock. Above me on the bridges, I thought I heard some men shouting. The ship shook, and there and there was that that sound, a monstrous metallic burp. What was it? It what was it? The collective scream of animals and animals protesting their overcoming death. Was it the ship itself giving up the ghost? I fell over. I got to my feet. I looked overboard again. The sea was rising. The waves were getting closer. We were sinking fast. I clearly heard monkeys shrieking. Something was shaking the deck. A, a Garan Indian wild ox exploded out of the rain and thundered by me terrified. Out of control berserk. I looked at it dumbstruck and amazed. Who in God's name had let it out? I ran for the stairs to the bridge. Up there was where the officers were, the only people on the ship who spoke English, the masters of our destiny here. The ones who would right the wrong. They would explain everything. They would take care of my family and me. I climbed to the main, the middle bridge. There was no one on the starboard side. I went to the port side. I saw three men, crew members. I fell. I got up. They were lo looking overboard. I shouted. They turned. They looked at me and at, and at each other. They spoke a few words. They came towards me quickly. I felt gratitude and relief welling up in me. I said, Thank God I found you. What is happening? I'm very scared. There's water at the bottom of the ship. I am worried about my family. I can't get to the level where our cabins are. Is this normal? Do you think one of the men interrupting me by thr interrupted me by thrusting a life jacket into my arms and shouting something in Chinese? I noticed an orange whistle dangling from the life jacket. The men were nodding vigor vigorously at me when they took hold of me and lifted me, me up in their strong arms. I thought of no nothing of it. I thought they were helping me. I thought I was so I was so full of trust in them that I felt grateful as they carried me in the, in the air. Only when they threw me overboard I begin 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 to have doubts. Chapter thirty nine. I landed with a trampoline like bounce on the half unrolled tar tarpaulin covering a lifeboat 40 feet below. It was a miracle. I didn't hurt myself. I lost the life jacket except for the whistle, which stayed in my hand. The lifeboat had been lowered partway and left to hang. It was leaning from its davits, swinging in the storm from 20 feet above the water. I looked up. Two of the men were looking down at me, pointing wildly at the lifeboat and shouting. I didn't understand what they wanted to do. I thought they were going to jump in after me. Instead, they turned their heads, looked Looked, her, looked horrified, this creature appeared in the air, leaping with the grace of a race horse. The zebra missed the tar, tarpaulin. It was a male grant, weighing over 500 pounds. It landed with a loud crash on the last bench, smashing it and shaking the whole lifeboat. The animal called out. I might have expected the braying of an ass or the neighing of a horse. It's nothing of the sort. It could only be called a burst of barking. A qua ha ha, qua ha ha, qua ha ha, put out on the highest pitch of distress. The creature's lips were widely parted, standing upright and quivering, relieving yellow re revealing yellow teeth and, and dark pink gums. The light bulb fell through the air and we hit the seething water. Chapter 40 Richard Parker did not jump into the water after me. The oar I intended to use as a club floated. I held on to it as I reached for the life buoy now vacant of its previous occupant. It was terrifying to be in the water. It was black and cold and in rage. I felt as if I were at the bottom of crumbling well. Water kept crashing down on me. It stung my eyes. It pulled me down. I could hardly breathe. If there hadn't been the life buoy, I wouldn't have lasted a minute. I saw a triangle slicing the water 15 feet away. It was a shark's fin. An awful tingle, cold and liquid. 
went up and down my spine. I swam as fast as I could to to one end of the light boat. The end will and the end still covering by the tarpaul tarpaulin. I pushed myself on the life buoy with my arms. I could see Richard Parker. He wasn't on the tarpaulin or on the bench. He was at the bottom of the light boat. I pushed myself up again. All I could see briefly at the other end was the zebra's head thrashing about. As I fell back into the water, another shark shark's fin glided right before me. The bright orange tarpaulin was held down by a strong nylon rope that wove its way between metal garment grommets in the tarpaulin and blunt the hooks on the side of the boat. I happened to be treading water at the bow. The tarpaulin was not a, as securely fixed going over the stem, which had a very short prow. What in a fa what in a face would be called a snub nose, as it was elsewhere around the boat. There was little looseness of the tarpaulin as the rope went from one hook on one side of the stem to the next hook on the other side. I lifted the oar in the air and I shoved the hand into his looseness. Into his life-saving detail, I pushed the oar in as far as it would go. The lifeboat now has a prow projecting over the waves. If crookedly, I pulled myself up and wrapped my legs. Around the oar. The oar handle pushed up against the tarpaulin, the tarpaulin rope and, and oar held. I was out of the water. If only by a fluctuating two, three feet, the crest of the larger waves kept striking me. I was alone and orphaned in the middle of the Pacific, hanging onto an oar. An adult tiger in front of me, sharks beneath me, a storm raging about me. Had I considered my prospects in the light of reason, I surely would have given up and let go of the oar. Hoping that I might drown before being eaten, but I don't recall that a single thought during those first minutes of relative safety. I didn't even notice daybreak. I held on to the oar. I just held on. God only knows why. After a while, I made good use of the life buoy. I lifted it out of the water and put the oar through the, its hole. I, wor I worked it down until the ring was hugging me. Now it was the o now it was only with my legs that I had to hold on. If Richard Parker appeared, it would be, be more awkward to drop from the oar. But one tear at a time, Pacific before Tiger. Chapter 41 The elements allowed me to go on living. The lifeboat did not sink. Richard Parker kept out of, kept out of sight. The sharks prowled but did not lunge. The waves slashed me but it did not pull me up. I watched the ship as it disappeared with much burbling and belching. Lights flickered and went out. I looked about for my family, for survivors, for another lifeboat, for anything that might bring me hope. There was nothing. Only rain marauding, waves of black ocean and flowed sand of tragedy. The darkness melted away from the sky. The rain stopped. I could not stay in the position I was in forever. I was cold. My neck was sore from holding my head and from all the cr craning I've been, I had been doing. My back hurt from leaning against the life buoy, and I needed to be higher up if I were to see other lifeboats. I inched my way along the oar till my feet were against the bow of the boat. I had to proceed with extreme caution. My guess was that Richard Parker was on the floor of the lifeboat beneath the tarpaulin, his back to me facing the zebra, which he had no doubt c killed by now. Of the five senses, tigers rely the most on their sight. Their eyesight is very keen, especially in detecting motion. Their hearing is good, their smell is average, I mean, compared to other animals, of course. Next to Richard Parker, I was dead, blind and nose dead, but at the moment, he could not see me. And in my wet condition, could possibly, could probably not smell me. And what with the whistling of the wind and the hissing of the sea as waves broke, if I were careful, he would not, he could, he would not hear me. I had a chance so long as he did not sense me. If he did, he would kill me right away. Could he burst through the tarpaulin? I wondered. Fear and reason fought over the answer. Fear and yes. He was fierce, 450-pound carnivore. 
Each of his claws was as sharp as a knife. Reason and no, no, the tarpaulin was stu was sturdy canvas, not a Japanese paper wall. I landed upon it from a height. Richard Parker could shred it with, with his claws with a little time and effort, but he could pop through it like a jack-in-the-box. And he had not seen me. Since he had not seen me, he had no reason to claw his way through it. I slid along the oar. I brought both my legs to one side of the oar and placed my feet on the gunwale. The gunwale is the top edge of a boat. The rim, if you want. I moved a little more till my legs were on the boat. I kept my eyes fixed on the horizon of the tarpaulin. Any second I expected to see Richard Parker rising up and coming for me. Several times I had fits of fearful trembling. Precisely where I wanted to be most still, my legs was where I trembled the most. My legs drummed upon the tarpaulin. Uh, a more obvious rapping on Richard Parker's door could be imagined. The trembling spread to my arms and it was all I could do and all and it was all I could do to hold on. Each fit passed. When enough of my body was on the boat, I pulled myself up. I looked beyond the, the end of the tarpaulin. I was surprised to see that the zebra was still alive. It lay near the stern where it had fallen, listless, but its, it, but its stomach was still panting and its eyes were still moving. Expressing terror, it was on its side facing me. Its head and neck awkwardly popped up, a uh, pop, pro, awkwardly propped against the boat's side bench. It had badly broken a rear it had ba ba it had badly broken a rear leg. The angle of it was completely unnatural. Bone protruded through skin and there was bleeding. Only its slim front legs had a semblance of normal position. They were bent and neatly tucked against its twisted torso. From time to time the zebra looked shook the zebra shook his head and barked and snorted. Otherwise it lay quietly. It was a lovely animal. Its wet markings glowed brightly white and intensely black. I was so eaten up by anxiety that I could dwell on it, still on it, still in passing as a faint afterthought the queer, clean, artistic boldness of its design and the fa fineness of its head struck me. Of greater significance to me was the strange fact that Richard Parker had not killed it. In the normal course of things, he would have killed a zebra. That's what predators do. They kill prey in the present circumstances. When Richard Parker would be under tremendous mental strain, fear should have brought out an exceptional level of aggression. The zebra should have been properly butchered. The reason behind its spared life was revealed shortly. It froze my blood and then brought a slight measure of relief. A head, a, a head appeared beyond the end of the tarpaulin. It looked at me in, in direct fright, in a in a direct frightened way. Ducked under, appeared again. Ducked under again, appeared once more. Disappeared a last time. It was the bear-like, balding look. Oh, bear-like, balding-looking head of a spotted hyena. Our zoo had a clan of six, two dominant females and four subordinate males. They were supposed to be going to Minnesota. The one here. As a male, I recognized it by its right ear, which was badly torn, its, he its heel jagged edge testimony to old violence. Now I understood why Richard Parker had not killed the zebra. He was no longer abo aboard. There couldn't be both a hyena and a tiger in such a small space. He must have fallen off the tarpaulin and drowned. I had to explain t to, to myself how a hyena had come, on, ca had come to be on the lifeboat. I doubted hyenas were capable of swimming in open seas. I concluded, I concluded that I must have, must have been up on board all along, hiding under the tarpaulin, and that I had noticed it when I landed with a bounce. I realized something else. The hyena, the hyena was the reason those sailors had thrown me into the lifeboat. They were trying to save my life. That was the last of their concerns. They were using me as fodder. They were hoping that the hyena would attack me, that somehow I would get rid of it and make the boat safe to them, no matter if it cost me my life. 
Now I knew what they were pointing at so fiercely just before the zebra disappeared. I never thought that finding myself confined in a small space with those spotted hyena would, would be good news. But there you go. In fact, the new, good news was doable. Oh, oh. <laughs> the good news was double. If it weren't for this hyena, the, sa the sailor would have thrown me into the lifeboat, and I would stay on the ship, and I surely would have drowned. And if I had to share quarters with an animal, better be the upfront ferocity of a dog than the power and stealth of a cat. I breathed the smallest sigh of relief. As a precautionary measure, I moved onto the oar. I sat astride it. I sat astride it on the rounded edge of the speared life buoy, my left foot against the tip of the prow, my right foot on the gunwale. It was comfortable enough that I was facing the boat. I looked about. Nothing but sea and sky, the same when we were at the top of the swell. The sea briefly imitated every land, fe land feature, every hill, every valley, every plain, accelerated geo geotectonics around the world in 80 swells. But nowhere on it could I find my family. Things floated in the water, but none that brought me hope. I could see no other lifeboats. The weather was changing rapidly. The sea, so immense, so breath taken, breathtakingly immense, was settling into a smooth and steady motion. The waves at, a, at heel. The wind was softening into a ton, tuneful breeze. Radiantly wide clouds were beginning to light up in a vast fathomless dome of delicate pale blue. It was the dawn of a beautiful day in the Pacific Ocean. My shirt was already beginning to dry. The night had vanished so quickly, vanished as quickly as the ship. I began to wait. My thoughts swung wildly. I was either fixed on practical details of immediate survival or Transfixed by pain, weeping silently, my mouth open, and my head, and my hands in my head. Chapter forty-two. She came floating on an island of bananas in a halo of of light, a lovely as lovely as the as the as as lovely the Virgin Mary. The rising sun was behind her. Her flaming hair looked stunning. I cried, O oh, blessed great mother, Pondicherry, fertility, goddess, provider of milk and love, wondrous arm spread of comfort, terror of ticks, pickler of cry, crying ones. Are you to witness the tra tragedy too? It's not right that gentleness met, gentleness met meet horror. Better that you had died right away. How bitterly glad I am to see you. You bring joy and pain in e equal measure. Joy because you are with me, but pain because it won't be for long. What do you know about the sea? Nothing. What do I know about the sea? Nothing. Without a driver, this bus is lost. Our lives over. Come aboard it if your destination is ob is oblivion. If sh it should be our next stop, we can sit together. You can have the window seat if you want. But it's a sad view. Oh, enough of this dissembling. Let me. Say it plainly. I love you. 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 Not the spiders, please. It was orange juice, so called, because she tended to drool, our pri to draw prize, Borneo orangutan matriarch, Sue Star, and mother of two fine boys. Surrounded by a mass of black spiders that crawled around her le like mal mal malevolent worshippers, the bananas on which she floated were held together by the nylon net with, with which they had been lowered into the ship. When she stepped off the banana into the boat, they bobbed up and rolled over. The net became loose without thinking about it only because it wasn't at, at hand's reach and about to sink. I took hold of the net and pulled it abroad. I, I pulled it aboard, a casual gesture that would turn out to be a lifesaver in many ways. The net would become one of my most precious possessions. The bananas, the bananas came apart. The black spider crawled as fast as they could, but their situation was hopeless. The island crumbled beneath them. They all drowned. The lifeboat 
The light bulb briefly floated in a, in a sea of fruit. I picked up what I thought was a useless net, but I, but did I think of reaping for the banana manna? No, not a single one. It was a banana split in the wrong sense of the term. The sea dispersed them. The colossal waste would later weigh on me heavily. I would nearly go into convulsions of despair at my stupidity. Orange juice was in a fog. Her gestures were slow and tentative, and her eyes reflected deep mental confusion. She was in a state of profound shock. Profound shock. She lay flat on the tarpaulin for several minutes, quiet and still, before reaching over and flowing into the lifeboat proper. I heard a hyena scream. Chapter 43. The last trace of the I saw the ship was a patch of oil glimmering on the surface of the water. I was certain I wasn't alone. It was a it was inconceivable that the Tim Sum which which should should sink without eliciting, oh, eliciting a peep of concern. Right now in Tokyo, in Panama City, in Madras, in Honolulu, why even in Winnipeg, red lights were blinking, um, consoles alarm bells were ringing, eyes were opening wide in horror, mouths were gasping. Oh my, my God! The Tim Sum has sunk, and hands were reaching for phones. More red lights were starting to blink. And more alarm bells were starting to ring. Pilots would, pilots were running to their planes with their shoelaces still untied. With such, with, such was their hurry. Ship officers were spinning their wheels t- till they were feeling dizzy. Even submarines were serving underwater to join in the rescue effort. We would be rescued soon. A ship would appear on the horizon. A gun would be found to kill the hyena put the zebra out of its misery. Perhaps orange juice could be saved. I would climb abroad, c- climb aboard to be greeted by my family. They would have been picked up in another lifeboat. I only had to ensure my survival for the next few hours until this rescue ship came. I reached from my perch for the net. I rolled it up and tossed it midway to the tarpaulin to act as a barrier, however small. Orange juice had seemed pr- practically cal- cataleptic. My eyes, my guess was she was dying of shock. It was the hyena that worried me. I could hear it whining. I clung to the hope that a zebra, a familiar prey, an orangutan, and a, an, an, a film, unfamiliar one would distract me, would distract it from thoughts of me. Okay. I kept one eye on the horizon, one eye on the under, on the other end of the lifeboat. Other than the hyenas whining, I heard very little from the animals. No more than claws scuffing against the hard surface and occasional groans and arrested cries. No majoring flight seemed to be taking place. Mid morning, the hyena appeared again. In the preceding minutes, its whining had been rising in a volume to a scream. It jumped over the zebra onto the stern, where the lifeboat side's benches came together to form a triangular bench. It was a fairly exposed. It was a fairly exposed position. The distance between bench and gunnel be- being about twelve inches. The animal nervously peered upon- appeared beyond the boat, beholding a vast expanse of shifting water seemed to be the last thing I wanted to see, for it instantly brought its head down and dropped to the bottom of the boat behind the zebra. That was cramped that was a cramped space. Between the broad back of the zebra and the sides of the buoyancy tanks that went all around the boat beneath the benches, there wasn't much room left for the hyena. It thrashed about a moment before climbing to the stern again and jumping back to the zebra to the middle of the boat disappearing beneath the tarpaulin this burst uh, of activity lasted less than 10 seconds the hyena came t- to within 15 feet of me my only reaction was to freeze with fear the zebra by comparison swiftly re- reared its head and barked I was hoping the hyena would stay under the tarpaulin. I was disappointed. Nearly immediately, it leapt over the zebra and onto the st- stern bench again. There, 
it turned on itself a few times, whimpering and hesitating. I wondered what, what it was going to do next. The answer came quickly. It brought its head low and ran around the zebra in a circle, transforming the stern bench, the side benches, and the cross bench just beyond the tarpaulin into a 25-foot inner track. It did one lap, two, three, four, five, and onwards, nonstop, until I lost count. And the whole time lap after lap, it went yip, 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 in, high, in a high-pitched way. My reaction once again was very slow. I was seized by fear and could only watch. The beast was going at a good clip, and it was no... Oh, uh, actually was, uh, no small animal. It was an adult male that looked to be 140 pounds. The beating of its legs against those benches made the whole boat shake, and its claws were loudly clicking on their surface. Each time it came from the, stir the stern, I tensed it. It was hair-raising enough to see the thing racing my way. Worse still, it was the fear that it would keep going straight. Clearly, orange juice, wherever she was, would not be, would not be an obstacle. And the rolled-up tarpaulin and the bulge of the net were even more pit more pitiful defenses with the slightest of efforts the hyena could be at the bow, the bow right at my feet it didn't seem intent to, on that course of action every time it came to the cross bench it took it and i saw the upper half of its body moving rapidly along the edge of the tar tarpaulin but, uh, but in this state the hyena's behavior was highly unpredictable and it could decide to attack me without warning. After a number of laps, it stopped short of the stern bench and crouched, directing its gaze downwards to the space below the tarpaulin. It lifted its eyes and rested them up upon me. The look was nearly the typical look of a hyena blank and frank. The curiosity apparent with nothing of the mental set revealed jaw hanging upon Big ears sticking up rigidly, eyes bright and black were it not for the stain, the strain that excluded from every cell of its body. My anxiety, my anxiety that made the animals glow as if with a fever, I prepared, I prepared for my end, for nothing. It started running in circles again. When animals decide to do, decide to do something for a very long time, oh, it can do it for a very long time. All morning, the hyena ran in circles, going yip, 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 yip. Once, it, once in a while, it briefly stopped in, in the stern bench. But otherwise, every lap was identical to the previous one, with no variation in moment, in speed, in the pitch of the volume of the yipping, it, in the counterclockwise direction of travel. Its yipping was shrill and annoying in the extreme. It became so tedious and draining to watch that I, I eventually turned my head on the side, trying to keep guard with the corner of, of my eyes. Even the zebra, which I first noted each time, the hyena raised by its head, fell into a stupor. Yet, every time the hyena paused on the stern bench, my heart jumped, and as much as I wanted to drag my attention to the horizon to where my salvation lay, it kept straying back to, the man to this maniacal beast. I am not one to hold prejudice against any animal, but it is a plain fact that the spotted hyena is not well served in my, by its appearance. By its appearance, it is it is ugly beyond redemption. Its neck, its thick neck and high shoulders that slope to the hind quarters look as if they've won, they've come from a discarded prototype for the draft, and its shaggy, coarse coat seem to have been patched together from the Leftovers of creation. The color is a, the color is a bungled mix of tan, black, yellow, gray, and the spots have none from of the classy ostentation of the leopard's rosettes. They look rather like the symptoms of, of a skin disease, a, vir, a vir, virulent form of mange. The head is broad and too massive with a high forehead like that of a bear but suffering from a receding hairline. And with ears that look ridiculously mouse like, large and round, when they haven't been torn off in battle, the mouth 
is forever open and panting. The nostrils are too big, the tail is scraggly and unwagging. The gait is shambling, all the parts put together look dog like, but no but dog like but like no dog would want as a pet. But I had not forgotten father's words. These were not cow cowardly carrion eaters. Okay. Uh if National Geographic portrayed them as, as such, it was because National Geographic during the day, National Geographic film, film during the day. It is when the moon rises that the hyena's day starts, and it proves to be a devastating hunter. Hyenas attack its packs whenever animals can be run down. Its flanks opened while it was still, still in full motion. They go for zebras, news, and water buffaloes, and not only the old or the infirm in a herd full grown her, in a herd full grown members too. They are hardly attackers rising up from the buttings and kickings immediately, never giving up for a simple lack of will. And they are clever anything that can be distracted from its mother is good. The ten minute old new is a favorite dish, but hyenas also eat young lions and young rhinoceroses. Oh yeah. R young rhinoceros. <laughs> they are diligent with their efforts are rewarded. They're, they are diligent with their efforts are rewarded in fifteen minutes flat that in in fifteen minutes flat all that will be left of a zebra is a skull. Yet may which may which may yet be dragged away and gnawed down by at leisure by young ones in the air. Nothing goes to waste. Even grass upon which blood has been split will be eaten. Hyenas' stomachs swell visibly as they swallow huge chunks of kale. If they're lucky, they become so full that they have difficulty swallowing. Oh, they have difficulty moving. Once they've digested their kill, they cough up dense hairballs, which they pick clean of edibles before rolling in them. Accidental ca cannibalism is a commonly occurrence, common occurrence during the excitement of a feeding. In reaching by in reaching for a bite of zebra, a hyena will take the large ear and nostril or a clan member. No hard feelings intended. Hyenas felt so disgust felt no disgust at this mistake. Its delights are too many to admit to disgust at anything. In fact, a hyena catholically of of taste is so indiscriminate it nearly forces administration. The hyena will drink from water even as it is urinating in it. The animal has 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 another original use for its urine. A hot dry weather it will cool itself by relieving its bladder on the ground and stirring of a refreshing mud bath with its paws. Hyenas snack on the excrement of herbivores with the clu with clucks of pleasure. It's an open Question: So, as to what hyenas won't eat, they eat their own kind. The rest of, of those whose ears and nose they grab down as appetizers once they're dead. After a period of aversion that lasts about one day, they will even attack motor vehicles, the headlights, the exhaust pipe, the side mirrors. It is it is not their gastric juices that limit hyenas, but the power of their jaws, which is formidable. That was the animal I had racing around in circles before me, an animal to paint the eye and chill the heart. Things things ended in typical hyena fashion. It stopped at the stern and started producing deep groans interrupted by fits of heavy panting. I pushed myself in on the oar till, the on, till, till only the tips of my feet were holding on to the boat. The animal hacked and coughed. Abruptly, it vomited. A gush landed behind the zebra. The hyena's dropped into what it had just produced. It stayed there, shaking and whining and turning around on itself, exploring the furthest confines of animal anguish. It did not move from the restricted space of the rest of the day. At times, the zebra made noises about the predator just behind it, but mo mostly it, it lay in hopeless and sullen silence. Okay, chapter 44. I think this might be, the, oh, chapter 45. I think chapter 45 might be the last chapter. 
The sun climbed to the sky, reached its zenith, began to come down. I spent the entire day perched on an oar, living only as much as was necessary to stay balanced. My whole being tended towards the spot on the horizon that would appear and save me. It was a state of tense, breathless boredom. Those first hours are associated in my memory with one sound. Not one you'd guess, but the yipping of the hyena or the hissing of the sea. It was the buzzing of flies. There were flies ab aboard the lifeboat. They emerged and flew about it in the way of flies. In great lazy orbits, except when they came close to each, to each other, when they spiraled together with dizzying speed and a burst of buzzing. Some were brave enough to venture out to where I was. They looped the boat or had come with one of the animals. The hyena most likely, I can't say. But whatever their origin, they didn't last long. They all disappeared within two days. The hyena be from behind the zebra snapped at them and ate a number. Others were probably swept out to sea by the wind. Perhaps a few lucky ones came to their life's terms and died of old, died of old, age, oh, died, of old died of old age. As evening approached, my anxiety grew. Everything about the end of the day scared me. A night a ship would have a difficulty seeing me. A night a ship would have difficulty have difficulty seeing me. A night the a, a night the hyena be, be, might become active again and maybe orange juice too. Darkness came. There was no moon. Clouds hit the stars. The, the contours of things had became hard to distinguish everything that disappeared, the, the sea, the life of my own body. The sea was quiet, there was hardly any wind, so I couldn't even ground myself in sound. I seemed to be floating in pure abstract blackness. I kept my eyes fixed on where, where I thought the horizon was. While my ears were on guard for the sign of the animals, I could imagine lasting the night. Sometime during the night of the night the hyena began snarling and the zebras barking and squealing. And I heard a re repeated knocking sound. I shook with fright and I will hide nothing here. Relieved myself in my pants, but these sounds came from the other end of the light bulb. I couldn't feel my I couldn't feel any shaking that indicated movement the hellish beast was apparently staying away from me. From near in the blackness, I began hearing loud expirations and groans and grunts and various wet mouth sounds. The idea of orange juice stirring was too much for my nearest to hear, so I did not consider. I simply ignored the thought there were no noises coming from beneath me from the water. Sudden flapping sounds and swishing sounds that were over and done with an instant. The battle for life was taking place there, too. The night passed minute, minute by slow minute. Chapter 45 I was cold. It was a distracted observation, as if it didn't concern me. Daybreak came. It came quickly. It happened quickly, yet by impercept imperceptible degrees. A corner of the sky changed colors. There began filling the light. The calm sea opened up around me like a great book. Still felt like, it felt like night. Suddenly, it was day. Warmth came only when the sun looked like an and like an electrically lit orange, broke across the horizon. And but I didn't wait, but I didn't need to wait that long to feel it. With the very first rays of light, it came alive in me. Hope. As things emerged in outline and filled with color, hope increased until it was like a song in my heart. Oh, what it was to bask in it. Things would work out, yet the worst was over. I had survived the night. Today, I would be rescued. To think that, to string those words together in my mind, it was, was, was itself a source of hope. Hope fed on hope. As the horizon came a neat, sharp line, I scanned, and scanned it eagerly. The day was clear again, and visibility was perfect. I imagined Robbie would greet me at first with a tease. What's this? He would say. You find yourself a great big life bulb you fill, you, and you fill it with animals? You think no, you think you're Noah or something? Father would be unshaven and disheveled. Mother would look to the sky and take me in her arms. 
I went through a dozen versions of what it was going to be like on the rescue ship, variations of this, of, on the theme of sweet reunion. That morning, the horizon might curve, might curve one way. My lips, out, my lips resolutely curved the other in a smile. Strange as it might sound, it was only after a long time that I took to see what was happening in the life of the hyena had attacked the zebra. Its mouth was bright red. It was chewing on a piece of hide. My eyes automatically searched for for the wound, uh, for the for the area uh, under attack. I gasped with horror. The zebra's broken leg was missing. The hyena had bitten it off and dragged it to the stern behind the zebra. A flap of skin hung limply over the raw stump. Blood was still dripping. The victim bore its suffering patiently without showing remonstrations. A, s a slow and constant grinding of its teeth, the only visible sign of distress, shock, r revulsion, and anger surged through, through me. I felt intense hatred for the hyena. I thought of doing something to kill it, but I did nothing, and my outrage was short-lived. I must be honest about that. I did have pity to spare for long f for the zebra. When your life is threatened, you said uh, your sense of empathy is blunted by a terrible selfish hunger for survival. It was sad. It was suffering so much for, be for being a big, strapping creature. It wasn't as at the end of its ordeal. But there was nothing I could do about it. I felt pity, then I moved on. This is not something I am proud of. I'm sorry I was so callous about the matter. I have not forgotten that poor zebra and what it went through. Not a prayer goes by that I don't I that I don't think of it. There is still no sign of orange juice. I turned my eyes to the horizon again. That afternoon the wind picked up a little and I noticed something about the light bulb. Despite its weight, it floated lightly on the water, no doubt because it was carrying less than its cap than its capacity. We had plenty of free board the distance between the water and the grunnel. I would take a mean sea to swamp us. Oh. It would take a mean sea to swamp us, but it also meant that whatever end of the boat was facing the wind to fall away, bringing us broadside to the waves. With small waves, the result was a ceaseless fist-like beating against the bowl, against the hull, while larger waves made for a tiresome rolling of the boat as it leaned from side to side. The jerky and incessant motion was making me feel queasy. Perhaps I would, I would feel better in a new position. I slid down the oar and shifted back onto the boat. I sat facing the waves with the rest of the boat to my left. I was closer to the hyena, but it wasn't stirring. It was as I was breathing deeply and concentrating on making my nausea go away that I saw orange, ju orange juice. I had imagined that her completely out of sight near the bu near the bow beneath the tarpaulin as far from the hyena as she could get. Not so. She was on the side of the bench just beyond the edge of the hyena's indoor track and barely hidden from from me by, by the bulge of rolled up tarpaulin. She lifted her head only an inch or so and right away I saw her. Curiosi curiosity got the best of me. I had to see her better. Despite the rolling on of the bow, I brought, I brought myself to a kneeling position. The, he, the hyena looked at, looked at me but did not move. Orange Julius. <laughs> I can't want, I keep wanting to say Orange Julius because but um, orange juice came into sight. She was deeply slouched and holding onto the gunnel with both her hands. Her head sunk very slow beneath her arms. Her mouth was open and her, and her tongue was lolling about. She was visible, panting, despite the tragedy afflicting me. Despite not feeling well, I let out a laugh. Everything about orange ju juice at that moment spell spelled out one word, seasickness. The imagine. The image of a new species popped into my head. The rare seafaring green orang orangutan, I returned to my seat sitting position. The, door, the, the poor deer looked so humanly sick. It, was a, it is a particularly funny thing to read human traits in animals, especially in apes and monkeys, where it is so easy. S simians 
are the clearest mirrors we have in the animal world. That is why they are so popular in zoos. I laughed again. I brought my hands to my chest, surprised at how I felt. Oh my, this laughter was like a volcano of, ha of happiness erupting in me. And orange juice had not, had not only cheered me up, she had also taken on both our feelings of seasickness. I was feeling fine now. I returned to scrutinize the horizon. I returned to scrutinizing the horizon, my hopes high. Besides being deathly seasick, there was something else about orange juice that was remarkable. She was uninjured, and she had her back turned to the hyena, as if she felt she could safely ignore it. The ecosystem of this light bulb was decidedly baffling, since there are no natural conditions in which a spotted hyena and an orangutan can meet. There being what none of the first in Borneo and none of the second in Africa, there is no way of knowing how they would relate. But it seemed to me, but it seemed to to me highly improbable, if not totally incredible, that when brought together, these frugivorous tree dwellers and carniv carnivorous savanna dwellers would be so radically carved radically carve out their niches as to pay, atten pay no attention to each other. Surely an orangutan was well prayed to a hyena, hy hyena, albeit a strange one, one to be remembered afterwards for producing stupendous hair bulls, nonetheless better tasting than an exhaust pipe and well worth looking out for when, when near trees. And surely a hyena would smell of a predator to an orangutan a reason for being vigilant when a piece of durian has been dropped to the ground. Dropped to the ground accidentally. But, but nature forever holds surprises. Perhaps it was not so. If goats could be brought to, li to, li to live amicably with rhino rhinoceros, why not orangutans with hyenas? That would be a winner at a zoo. A sign would be, have, would have to be up. I can see it already. Dear public, do not be afraid of orangutans. They are in the trees because that is where they live, not because they are afraid of the spotted hyenas. Come back at meal time or at a sunset until they get the, until they get thirsty, and you will see them climbing down from their trees and moving about the grounds, absolutely unmolested by the hyenas. Father would be fascinated. Sometime that afternoon, I saw the first specimen of what would become a deer, a reliable friend of mine. There was bumping and scraping sound against the hull of the light bow. A few seconds later, so close to the bow, I could have leaned down and grabbed it. A large sea turtle appeared, a hawk's bill. Flippers lazily turning head, sticking out of the water. It was, looking, it was striking looking in an ugly sort of way with a rugged yellow-brown shell about three feet long and spotted with patches of algae and dark green face with a sharp beak, no lips, to that of an ill-tempered old man who has, who has complaining on his mind. The queerest thing about the reptile was simply that it was, it looked incongruous. Floating there in the water, so odd in its shape compared to the sleek, slippery design of fish, yet it was plainly in its element and it was who I was and it was I would and it was I was oh what the heck <laughs> sorry yet it was plainly in its element and it was I who was the odd one out I hovered by I hovered it hovered by the boat for several minutes I said to it go tell the ship I'm here go go I turned and sank out of sight back flippers pushed pushing water in alternate strokes Okay, so I read about an hour, a hundred percent orange juice. Yeah, I was thinking orange Julius, but yeah, a hundred percent orange juice is a game. Okay, well, uh, I read for about an hour. I will see who I can uh, raid. Hold on. Let me go into Twitch.
Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I will read Mari Mari Ian. I think I can do that. Okay, thank you for coming to my reading today. I think I'll read more next week, um, hopefully. Uh, so thank you for coming. Have a good night. Bye.